So in the first part of this video, I'm going to show you how to set up uh, a new project in Model Sim. So we're going to download uh, the calc1 underscore black box uh, zip file that you need, and we'll save that to our downloads folder. We you can get that from Blackboard, but I'm going to open that folder up, cut that zip file from that location, and move it to a new folder. So we can... So in documents, I'm going to create a folder for design verification and for this demonstration, I suggest you create a folder such as db underscore ASS1 um, for your assess first assignment. So we put the zip file in there and then we're going to open it with Archive Manager. That will allow us to access it. From within there, we then just copy that folder. Don't cut it because it's inside a zip file. So just copy it and then paste it uh, into your project folder. You should see inside all of these files. We can then delete the zip file. And now we can close our file browser and leave Blackboard open for a minute. So I'm just going to minimize that. And then we're going to go to System Tools and open a terminal, terminal so that we can start uh, Model Sim using the command vsim ampersand. We see that I've already had a project, so I'm going to do a new project for this demonstration. So we go File, New Project, and then we give it a name. So for this example, dv underscore ass1 underscore demo, and then we select the folder. So you have to, to kind of close and reopen uh, the folder to the folders sometimes to see everything that's within them. And then we just accept the default options and click OK. So at this point, we'd like to add the example test bench. So we're going to download the example test bench from the assignments page on Blackboard. And we'll save that. Again, it goes into our downloads folder. So we'll cut it from our downloads folder and move it to the project folder. So we just paste that into the project folder alongside the uh, model sim project file there, the .mpf, and we can now close that down. And then we can do add existing file inside model sim and find the file we want. We leave it as reference from current location and we can select the language type. Default, we'll use the extension. We're going to select Verilog. You could also use system Verilog, which has the extension .sv. So now we should see that our project has picked up calc1 underscore black underscore box already, that library which you need, and you should have the example calculator project file there. And if you compile it as shown, it should give you a successful compilation at the bottom. If that compilation fails, then you've not managed to add the library. Double clicking on a message will show a dialog window with more information. So in the first part of this video, we looked at how to set up a new project and include the calc1 black box uh, library so you can access the calc1 module uh, to do your verification against and we also saw how you could add the existing template test bench file to that project in order to, the next part of this video is about how to use verilog i'm going to try and explain a bit about what verilog is um, and how you can use that to build a test bench in order to do that i've created a completely different project it's nothing to do with your assignment uh, it's a very simple buffer module. This buffer module acts like a philo stack, so first in, last out. So it's a stack where we push some stuff on and then we can pop some stuff off. And whatever, when we pop something off, whatever we pushed on last uh, or more, most recently comes off first. So what I've then done is I've taken that single philo stack and can created a module that wraps them that allows you to have two channels to access two different um, Philo stacks. The two channels can actually be uh, directed at one stack or the other though. So the two channels uh, can be multiplexed or directed to uh, one channel or uh, one stack or the other. This means that we can use channel A to issue commands like push, pop, peak, or no command. Uh, to either of the stacks and likewise channel B to either of the stacks. There's also some interesting corner cases that I've deliberately not dealt with. For example, pushing too many things onto the stack or popping things when nothing's on the stack or dealing with what happens if you assign both channels to the same stack 
um, with a command at the same time. You know, who knows what happens there. I'm going to demonstrate how we can create the structure for a test bench and that structure you should be able to reuse for your own assignment test bench. Um, not directly, you will need to edit the code a bit, um, but the, the basic idea and the, the Verilog and the understanding should be transferable. So to start with, we're going to look at the two test bench files I've already included in my project. I've already included the library dv underscore buffer, which includes the buffer and dual buffer modules. So the buffer module is a single buffer and the dual buffer is obviously the two buffers with uh, the two command channels. So we'll see that I have two test benches and if I double click on the first test bench for the single buffer, I get the code on the right hand side. And what I'm gonna do is actually drag this all the way over this side and shrink this column so we get as much area to edit the screen as possible. You can use other text editors, um, the model sim. So Notepad++ uh, is a reasonable one to edit Verilog with. Unfortunately, there aren't really any IDEs, uh, integrated development environments. So I suggest you just go with Notepad++ or model sim uh, or some other thing that gives you syntax highlighting uh, for Verilog and stick with that. You don't need anything hugely complicated. Okay, so this is some Verilog code. What I've already done in model sim is I've gone tools, edit preferences, by name, find, and then I've done two things to, my, to model sim to make it a bit more usable. I've changed the font size all over the place, uh, which involves changing that number from 12 to 16, and also change the uh, font size here which again if you set this to dash 16 it will change uh, and there's about six of those I've edited and then I've also changed the tab size uh, I don't know whether, whether I'm going to find this right now um, it takes a while so there we go tabs so if you find this tabs and then set that to four instead of eight otherwise tab width is way too big um, so that's what I've done to, to make model sim a little bit easier to edit in. And uh, now we'll have a look at what code I've got here. So the first line says use lib, and it gives a name that we're gonna use for that library, equals, and then says what name of library we should use. And in this case, it's the dv underscore buffer, uh, which is the same name we saw here in this library tab. So that gives us access to all of the modules inside of that uh, library. As you could do a similar thing if you set this to calc one underscore black underscore box. Uh, that gives you access to the calc one black box library, and then you can use the modules within that. And you'll see that that's already in your example test bench. The next line is setting a time scale. I'm not going to explain too much about this, but what this effectively means is that. Uh, it's the simulation time scale for how frequently, uh, how frequently it's going to simulate things happening. Uh, don't worry about it, just set it to this value for now. Um, so then we come to a define statement. So a define defines, uh, <laughs> unsurprisingly, uh, a name for a constant value. So you can't do macros like you can in uh, some fancier languages, but you can do simple definitions. So what I've done here is I've defined something called timeout and set that to 10 and we'll see how that's used later. And then I've defined uh, names for our for the four commands. So command none has the two bit value where I've then the bit that follows is in hex. So this says two bits and the value is in hex zero. And then I've defined something called command underscore push. And again, it's two bits where the value is in hex one. And likewise for the next two for pop and peak. So these are just defined within this file. And then we get down to the actual module declaration. Now this is where we start to declare some actual hardware 
for our test bench. So what it's important to remember is that with Verilog, we're always describing hardware. We're never describing sequential programming. We're always describing how circuits are going to fit together uh, and se sequential or combinatorial logic. Sorry, sequential or combinational logic components. So this module declaration declares a, a group of hardware that we can instantiate. And so we start with module and the name of the module, which I've called buffer underscore TB. You can use capital letters if you want to. I've chosen not to here by convention. And then for this particular module, I've defined some parameters. Parameters are non-variable um, at runtime or at simulation time or what we should say at synthesis. You can't change them uh, when, they, when you actually simulate the hardware, but you can change them when you compile your hardware. So compiling our hardware converts it from the syntax we see into a more concrete model. And then simulating our hardware is like when we power it on and actually run the thing. So these are compile time parameters that I've used to specify the depth of our buffer and the word size we're going to use. Now, these parameters come from the module I designed, from the buffer module. Uh, the count one does not actually have parameters like this, so you won't necessarily need to use them to parameterize the calculator itself, but you might find it useful to parameterize uh, other aspects of your test bench. So then we close that off with a single normal bracket. And then if there were inputs or outputs to or from this module, we have another set of normal brackets without the hash, and then the inputs or outputs go here. But we don't need that for what we're doing. Uh, this is a top level test bench, so it doesn't need any inputs or outputs. And then lastly, we have a semicolon to complete the line. Now, the indentation is not necessary. Uh, but it does make your code a lot more readable, so that's why I've used it. And in this case, I'm using tabs, but you could also use spaces if you if you feel like it. I'm only using tabs because that's what module sim supports. Um, so when we start a module up here, we then later have to end the module, and that's literally just the end module at the end of this. So you'll find in Verilog that you usually have something that begins a section, and something that ends a section. And then there's a few different syntaxes for that. But in this case, it's module and then end module. So next, we have a register. So a register is something that can store a value and be updated with a value later. Uh, it's, it's a kind of sequential element. So in this case, I've got a one bit register for the clock, a one bit register for the reset signal. And now I've got a two bit register in the order of most significant bit to least significant bit for the command to send to this single buffer. Then I've got a register going from the word size minus one. In this case, it's 32 minus one. So 31st bit down to, sorry, not 31st, but 31 down to zero. So most significant bit down to least significant bit. You can do this the other way around. So I could do this this way around, but then it wouldn't match the, the module declaration underneath. So the order of the bits has to match the design underneath. And the example test bench for, that you've been given will already show you what order to do these in. Um, and also note that this is two bits, uh, but the indexes are inclusive. So this isn't two down to zero for two bits. This is one to zero. So this is a 32 bit register um, called data in, and a th then I've got a wire. So a wire is different from a register in that a wire is continuously as connected or directly assigned um, to the output of something, of some expression or of another module. Um, so a wire is literally a wire in hardware. It's not something that you can assign a value and have it store it for later. It's something that is connected to something else to give it a value. You can put uh, combinational logic components uh, in an assignment to a wire. So for example, you could take 
the output of two registers, and them together and assign that to a wire. So then the wire is literally connected to the output of an AND gate, and the inputs of the AND gate would be connected to the outputs of the registers. Um, but yeah, you can't assign a sequential um, value to it. Whereas registers, you actually update them at some point. So you update a register, usually on the clock edge, uh, with some value. And it doesn't have to be the same value every time. I mean, the value of a register can come from different places, whereas the value for, for, of a wire, the, cir the circuit uh, connected to that wire is always fixed. So then I've got another register, which I've decided is 31 bits. Uh, down to zero, so it's 32 bits in total, uh, and then it's called counter. And notice that we don't assign these initial values like this. If you try and assign an initial value like this, you will find that your test bench does not do what you intended it to. It will compile, but it won't behave necessarily as you expect. So please avoid doing that. So the next thing we've got is a module dec declaration. And this is where we actually declare uh, the instance of hardware, the, the physical creation of the hardware for the buffer. So I've got buffer, then I've got, which is the name of the module to include. In your case, it will be the calc one. It's in the example test bench. Then we've got the name of this piece of hardware, which is just useful for us to refer to. In this case, it's DUV for design under verification. And then we have the signals that we need to connect to it. So the signals are inputs and outputs. So in this case, it's got a clock input, a reset input, a command input, a data in input, and a data out output. Notice that the outputs are connected to wires and the inputs are connected to registers. Although this isn't a universal rule, um, it is highly recommended for the simple style of uh, Verilog coding that you're going to be using. So if I compile this, I get a green tick and I get a green message down here. Next, we look at initial begin. So initial begin is code that uh, will execute or will be run once if you like, although we have to remember that this is hardware. So really what's happening is this will power on once um, at the beginning of, in this case, simulation or when the thing is powered on, but we're just dealing with simulation. So from now on, I'll just refer to simulation examples. So this is code that will happen initially when the system first starts simulating. And what it's gonna do is set clock to zero set reset to zero, set the command to whatever this is, which we'll look at in a second, and set data in to zero. So this thing is that constant uh, thing we declared earlier, and notice that it's preceded by a backtick. So the way to use these defined names is to do backtick followed by the name. The usual naming conventions for C style programming or Java, if you're familiar with Java, they apply. So you can't put um, weird symbols like backslash or forward slash um, or spaces in your names, uh, but you can put, uh, and you can't put dashes, but you can put underscores. Okay, so this code occurs when it first starts up when the simulation first starts. And the next line is an always line. So always repeatedly occurs. So it starts at the beginning of simulation in this case, and then we've got a hash delay. So this hash delay is how many simulation ticks to wait. In this case, it's 100 ticks to wait uh, before executing the line of code that follows. And the line of code that follows is this one. So what this says is that every 100 simulation ticks run this line of code. And what this line of code does is assign clock to not clock. So in this case, we use the tilde key. This should be on the, uh, on the hash key. So if you press shift and the hash key on your keyboard, um, then you will get a tilde, hopefully. Uh, it might be elsewhere on a Mac keyboard or non-UK keyboards. 
uh, in which case you will have to work it out for yourself. Um, I'm not going to go through every possible keyboard layout. So this assigns clock to not clock every 100 ticks. What this means is that we get an edge on the clock every, every 100 ticks. And because we define the time scale as being major time scale of one nanosecond, what this means is that we're simulating the clock inverting every 100 nanoseconds. Overall, this means that one clock cycle, uh, that's where we go from zero to one and back again, will take 200 nanoseconds or 200 ticks. You don't necessarily have to stick to 100, um, but I recommend you do um, for, for most of your work. So next we get another initial begin and we see that there's two initial begins now. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that these two sections of code are going to run in parallel. The simulation will actually simulate them as though they were in parallel because that's how hardware works. So both these initial begins are going to happen. Um, there isn't any particular order to them. And so while this first line of code is executing or while this block is executing, these will be executing. If we think about it, what we realize is that actually these assignments uh, don't depend on anything and there's no delays in them. There's no hash whatever's in there. Um, so they're not going to be slowed down by anything, so they will happen in the first time step. This on the other hand is a bit different. This is a for loop. This is not the same as an ordinary sequential for loop as you may be used to, um, but you can try and think of it like that uh, for most intents and purposes for your test bench. So this says using that counter register that we created up here, and bear in mind that you have to have enough bits to store the value that you're intending to store. So if I made this a one bit counter, uh, sorry, a two bit counter, that wouldn't store a value of 10, or it wouldn't even store above uh, three so that I'm gonna try and store in it. So do bear in mind that the size of your registers is going to matter. And in this case, so in this case, I've created a 32 bit counter. It starts at zero and it goes up until the timeout value, which is 10. So this counter is going to go from zero to nine. And we notice that Verilog does not have plus plus or plus equals. You have to do the full assignment counter equals counter plus one. And then we see the next bit of syntax where we get begin some block of code followed by end. So whenever you want to do multiple lines of code, you should do begin followed by end. And we've seen the same thing already with initial begin end and initial begin, and there's an end down here. So then what code is actually inside of this for loop? This code says, uh, this code will be elaborated into hardware, the number of times there's a counter. So in this case, So the code inside the loop is elaborated into hardware the number of times there's a counter. And in this case, it's a very simple at statement. This is actually an empty statement, so to speak. Uh, this at simply means do this statement at whatever, at a change occurring inside the brackets. And the change we've specified is the negative edge of the clock. Your test, your example test bench will show you whether things should be negative or positive edge triggered. In this case, I'm using negative edge triggered because I know that's what my design wants. So this just says do nothing for 10 negative edge occurrences of the clock. In other words, for 10 clock cycles. This is just a delay that allows the circuit to settle at the start and include these values. It may not necessarily be useful. So the next line of code will occur after the, or sorry, it will occur at the 10th clock cycle and it will set reset 
the reset register to a one, which will set the input to the design under verifications reset signal to a one. So from this, we can infer something that actually I'm not using reset so much as I'm using reset underscore end as it would normally be called. Now, what does that mean? Reset underscore end means it's an active low signal. Um, so instead of setting reset to a one when I want the design to reset, I actually set it to a zero when I want it to reset. And when I want it to operate normally, I set it to a one. It would be interesting to test whether this is always the case, but for this example, I'm just gonna stick with it. So then we see another one of these hash 200 things. And again, this is an empty statement. There's no code in here. So this is just going to delay everything that follows for 200 time, uh, 200 simulation ticks, which in this case is 200 nanoseconds, which we notice is one clock cycle. So there are other ways that I could write this. I could use a constant for it, but in this case, I've chosen to hard code it in as 200. Not the best style of code, but good enough. I could also decide to delay to the negative edge of the clock. And that would be a more flexible way of doing this test bench. So then I set the commands to be a push and I create some data. And it turns out that dead beef can be written in hexadecimal and is a nice, nicely readable and identifiable value. You'll see this all, all across software testing. So notice that I've not included a number here. I've not written 32 tick. This is allowed. I can just do uh, apostrophe, H, and then the value I want to put in. Um, so I could do one, or I could do dead beef, or, or whatever. And what this means is that Verilog and the simulator will work out how many will work out how many bits. What this means is that Verilog and the simulator will work out how many bits this value should be. And it will warn you if it's too many bits. If it's too few, it will simply pad out the top, the upper bits with zero. So then we delay another clock cycle, again, doing nothing during that time uh, or at the end of that time. And then we set the command to none, delay another clock cycle, set the command to pop, delay another clock cycle. Now I haven't changed the command here. So the command retains its previous value because it's a register. I've not assigned it a new value, so there's no reason why it should change. So I'm gonna delay another clock cycle. So I'm popping twice because I've done two clock cycles of pop. I happen to know from my design that that should result in two pops. It could be that a pop should take two clock cycles, in which case this would be a single pop, but it's not. As pop takes a single clock cycle, so delaying two clock cycles will repeat the command twice. I could have written this more efficiently by just writing hash 400 and delaying uh, for two clock cycles in one go, uh, or in a single line of code, sorry. Um, but for the sake of argument, this comment allows you to see that this is actually repeating the pop one more time. Then we can set the command to a push and set some new data. Notice that I can use lowercase and uppercase letters, it doesn't matter. Delay another clock cycle, set the command to peak, delay one more clock cycle, and then delay 600 clock cycles and do dollar stop. So dollar stop is something that doesn't translate into real hardware. Dollar stop is something purely for simulation. And what it does is it stops the simulation outright. So whenever your test bench gets to the end, you should have a dollar stop. So you should run all your tests and then dollar stop uh, at the appropriate moment. Don't do a dollar stop when a test fails because that would stop all the remaining tests from running and the simulation can't get past a dollar stop point. You can't make it run further really. Uh, and we won't auto test in that way. So put a dollar stop at the end when all of your tests have finished and you've printed out the information about which ones have failed and possibly also which ones have passed. So this is our very simple test bench. All it's really doing is running a push, a pop, another pop, a push, and then a peak, and then stopping. And it's not actually checked anything. 
So it's important to realize that this te test bench so far, all this is doing is driving the inputs. It's not checking the output in any way. So it's really not a test bench at all. All it is, is a kind of debug file. But I'm gonna show you what it does. So to start with, what we have to do is right click on the file we want, go to the compile menu and click compile selected. Hopefully we get a green tick. If I put some errors in, let's say for example, create a comment from the out of the end module, so double slash is a comment. If I compile this selected file, we get an error. If I double click on that error line, we can see it says near end of file, syntax error, unexpected end of source code. Not the most helpful error ever, um, but what we can tell from that is that some block of code wasn't terminated. So I'll close that window and change the code, introduce a different error, maybe introduce two different errors, and we'll see what happens. I'll tell you what, let's put the error in here when we've missed a semicolon. So if I now do compile, compile selected, we see we get an X and we get an error. And it says near end module, syntax error, unexpected end module. So it wasn't expecting to get an end. It wasn't expecting to get end module at that point, which probably means we forgot to close something. Yes, we forgot to close the end. Do another compile. Oh, it compiled successfully. So what we see here is that this semicolon wasn't really necessary because it's the same as just writing hash followed by another hash, which is okay. Um, possibly not the best example. Uh, what I could do is put a comment in here to kill that line of code and now this will give an error because you have to make an assignment and we see it gets one error and hopefully if I put that in there as well we'll see uh, uh, possibly not because um, yeah it will give you multiple errors it's just this code is slightly too simple and I'm not going to introduce more than necessary, but we see here near equals syntax error, unexpected equals expecting plus plus or minus minus. Um, so that's telling you that plus plus does exist, uh, but it's uh, a more system Verilog feature really, uh, not the older version of Verilog that we're using. So if we compile that, we see we, it's successful and eventually we get a tick. Sometimes that symbol can be a bit slow to update. So at this point, we want to try and simulate what we've got so far. And what we can do is we can go to simulate, start simulation, untick the enable optimization. If you forget to untick that, or if you just hit start simulation straight away, you will not see the signals and other information that you expect to see from your simulation. So untick enable optimization, go to your work, which is the library that contains the stuff you've just compiled for your project, and then select the module you want to simulate. In this case, I'm going to simulate the buffer underscore TB and click OK. This will take a little moment, possibly a bit longer if you've not run it before, to completely transform your layout. And then we go into this new tab that's opened up called Wave and we see it's blank. OK. It's blank to start with, and we get a sim thing on the side. Now we want to see if we can actually add something to this wave so we can see part of our simulation. So what I'm gonna do is go to view to start with and tick the objects option, which gives us this extra panel. I'm gonna ignore the extra information that's on the side here, just make that a bit smaller. And then from the simulation tab down here, I'm going to select the design under verification and I'm going to look at the signals, the objects that it gives me. And what I'm interested in is probably the clock, the reset, the commands, the data input and the data output. It will also, also show you some of the internal signals, but for your Calc 1 project, the thing is black box, so you can't see the signals inside. So you just have to use the input and output signals to and from the DUV. So then I can right click on these signals, do add to wave selected signals, and we see that they show up here. And initially they're X's. X means it doesn't have a value. It's neither a zero nor a one. 
it could be an error, it could just be floating somewhere in between 0 and 5 volts. Basically the simulation can't work it out. If you get a different kind of error you'll see a Z. Uh, Z means uh, something rather more complicated. Hopefully you won't see any Zs at all. You might just see Xs though if you discover errors and you will have to deal with Xs. Uh, so an X is an X on an output is always a mistake. An X on an input is also probably a mistake, uh, but the mistake will be in your test bench, not in the design itself. An X is caused by the thing driving uh, the signal. So if it's an input to the design, then your test bench is driving it. So an X would indicate that your test bench has a mistake. An X on the output indicates that something's gone wrong inside the design. Either it was driven with an X or something else went wrong, you found a bug and you need to deal with it. So in this case I've expanded out this signal list slightly so that we can see what's in here. And we see we've got the clock, the reset, the commands, the data input and the data output. And these also tell you the size in bits and the display in hexadecimal. So we've got 1 bit, 1 bit, 2 bits, 32 bits and 32 bits, which is what we expected to see. But so far there's nothing in the waveform viewer because we haven't simulated anything. So I've changed this to 2 US, 2 microseconds. If I click the run button, we see it simulates for 2 microseconds. But annoyingly, this window is really zoomed out. So we can't we have to scroll around it manually. So if we right click, we see some of the options for zooming. And I'm going to use zoom full, which is the F key on the keyboard. So when I press F, it will zoom so that everything, all the simulation that's happened so far, is visible in the waveform viewer. And here we can see the clock on the top, which is rising and falling as we expect. And if we measured the distance between here, we'd see that it would see exactly 100 nanoseconds. So what we can see is that we started with some values and they immediately got set to zeros as we expected. And this two microseconds should be 20 clock cycles, one, two, sorry, 10 clock cycles because it's 200 nanoseconds per clock cycle. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Great. So if we think about that in our simulation, we've got to the end of this loop because this was 10 clock cycles that it was going to wait. Okay. So what else can we do? Well, we can set breakpoints in model sim just by clicking next to the line number. So this means that when you've got sequential kind of logic happening, you can interrupt that and stop the simulation at that point and see what all the values of things are. So if you just want, if you don't want to run for a fixed length of time, if you would just want to run to a breakpoint or to the end of simulation, you can click the run all button, which will just let everything run unrestricted. So if I click run all now, we see it hits the breakpoint that I've set and I can start to inspect some of the values by hovering. So here I see that reset underscore n is a one, that counter in this case is letter a in hex, which is 10 in decimal, uh, clock is currently a one, uh, command is currently a zero because it's about to be set. So there's some things like that I can do and I can use the standard buttons that we're used to with software debugging up the top here, except they're done in a hardware kind of context. So if I step over, that will do various other things in the background if they're happening in parallel, but also do that set. So we see here that command is now set to a value of one and data in is still zero waiting to receive a value. And then I do step over and we see data in gets its value of dead beef. If you go back to the waveform and go to the end of this, uh, data, if I just click the, oh, doesn't. if you go to the end of the data, you'll see that it hasn't finished simulating this tick yet. So you can't actually see those changes. All right. So if I zoom in really close, you can see it's not actually got to those changes yet. So now I'm going to delay for 200 simulation, uh, ticks, in other words, 200 nanoseconds. And we see that 
suddenly when I click step over, it jumps to up here because this is the next line of code that's going to execute because we delayed 200, during which there was a 100 delay where clock should invert. If we go back to the waveform viewer, we can see that we've still not actually progressed because the next thing to happen is this clock switch. So what we're seeing is actually, it's not that we've gone from here and then another 100 nanoseconds, that's not what we've done. We've gone from here and immediately this is about to happen. And we know this because of the waveform viewer. So now I'm going to click step over and we'll see that that clocker happens. And then we get another one, which is now hopefully the negative edge, the falling edge. If we step over again, oops, so now I've stepped over again and it's gone into the actual design underneath the buffer dot because it knows where the source file is. In your simulation, you won't get this because your whole thing's black boxed. You might get some other uh, obfuscated code come up. So there's a limit to how far you can debug with this, and it's recommended to just apply breakpoints in the relevant places by clicking in the margin. Uh, so if I now click run all, oh, I've, I've actually gone too far. So I've gone to the end of the simulation here and we've hit the stop. So I can turn these breakpoints off and maybe I just want to get back to this one. Okay, so I can restart the simulation. I can't rewind, I have to just restart in this case. And I can hit run all, and we see we get through to this breakpoint. So now we can see that in our waveform, we have the command has been set to a one, the data has been set to dead beef, and that's occurred for one clock cycle. And now command is gonna change, and then other stuff will happen. So. If I click run all, I get to the dollar stop and that's where the simulation ends. And we can see here that this is where we were with this yellow marker. And we've gone a number more clock cycles, however many we intended to, and we can see the command changing in here as well. So we can see the command was one, then it was zero for a clock cycle, then it was two for two clock cycles, then the command was a one, and then a three for the remaining clock cycles. And what we see is that the input remained at dead beef the whole time. We pushed dead beef once, then we popped it. And at the end of that pop command, we got the output on the next clock cycle down here. And then we tried to do another pop and we ended up with zeros. Okay, so that's a feature of what our test bench, uh, of what our design under verification does. And then we got, uh, and then we did a push command of dead beef because that's what the data input was. And then we did a peak and we continued, we got the output of a peak one clock cycle later and we continued doing peaks. So the output continued to be dead beef uh, for the remainder of the simulation. But note that if any of this were incorrect, we wouldn't have picked up on anything because we've not actually checked anything yet. So all we've done so far is write some code that can drive the inputs and allow us to simulate and see the outputs. This is useful for debugging, but it's not useful for actually verifying that the thing is correct. So let's end the simulation there. And we're back to source code editing. And we'll see in the project that we have dual buffer underscore TB. So this is a test bench for the dual buffer setup. And it's very similar to the one I just showed you. It's got the same commands, the same timeout value, the same clock and reset signals. But now we've got two channels. So each channel, the channel A and channel B, we can select which underlying buffer it's going to access. Uh, and that's a single bit value. So zero is the first buffer, one is the second buffer. And those are selected independently. So we could select both channels as the same buffer. Then we can send a command to either channel, which will be routed to the relevant butter, buffer. Likewise, we can send data to either channel and we get output data from either channel and we see the, uh, the counter again. So here I've got the name of the module, the dual buffer. I've called it DUV again and I've given it the set of input and output signals. 
We have a similar initial begin section, which resets all the signals. We have the exact same clock set up. And this code is basically the same as what we had before. And it's just driving channel A this time. So I'll briefly compile this and show you a simulation. If I start simulation, I select the work, I select dual buffer, enable optimization is turned off, I click OK, I select my DUV, I go to my waveform, and then I select the signals I'm interested in, which is the channel information, click add to wave selected signals, expand this out so that I can see uh, what my signals are, and then just click run all until I hit dollar stop, which is the end of the simulation. And I see my waveform, not very useful in that zoom level. So I click F on the keyboard and this gives me a full view of what's going on. We can see that initially these values down here, these outputs are X's uh, for one clock cycle, but that's okay because that's when we're initializing. So we're in reset at this point and we see the reset is active low. And so that red just means there's X's. Now, anywhere later in the simulation, getting red would probably be a bad thing. Um, but in this case, it's, it's all right at the start for reset uh, because those values are gonna get cleared to zeros as we see. Uh, we can then see that reset remains low for 10 clock cycles and not much happens. And then it goes high and we start to get uh, inputs going through and we see the exact same patterns of inputs before, except this time on the A channel uh, and the B channel is just layered in between. And we can see here that I can, as I move the mouse around when I'm selecting, it highlights which row I'm on and which value I'm looking at. Okay, so I'll end that simulation. And in a moment, we're going to look at how we can actually turn this from being uh, just a debugging setup to actually being a verification setup. So something to notice about this test bench is at the moment I'm driving all the values uh, manually. There's no kind of code reuse here. So every time I'm assigning the command, I'm assigning it uh, directly. I'm not, there's no way, if I want to do more tests, I have to repeat code in this setup. So we're going to look at how we could maybe write some less repetitive code. And also the other thing we're not doing is actually checking the result. So let's see if we can do these two things uh, together. Okay, so I've now gone away and created an example task for us. Uh, so in this case, what we have is a task which allows us to run a certain amount of sequential kind of code um, line by line, basically. Uh, you can only call task tasks from within initial or always blocks. Uh, we'll see in a minute uh, the difference between tasks and functions and how you can use functions to generate values but not execute sequential code, whereas tasks you can use to, well, you could use them to generate values, but you wouldn't really want to use them like that. They normally use for things like driving inputs and then checking outputs. So in this case, I've got a task called test channels, and it's got a number of inputs. I've got ch, uh, which means channel, so channel select A. So that means selecting which underlying buffer for channel A. And then I've appended underscore L on this. So I want to be able to distinguish my local signals, these inputs to the task, from the global signals so that I can use both. So I've distinguished them here by putting underscore L, meaning underscore local, local to the task. So we've got task, name of task, test channels, uh, semicolon, and then the inputs, and the inputs take the same syntax uh, as registers basically. So uh, this is something of size two bits from most significant bit to least significant bit. It's called command underscore A underscore L. And we'll see how we can actually call this task in a minute. Let's look at what it does. So after we've got the input declarations, and you may also have output declarations from this task, uh, in, in this case, I don't have any outputs. You can also have registers 
that are local to just the task and wires that are local to just the task. And again, all of that would be declared here. Uh, so like this, for example, and this would be local to just this task. But I don't have, I don't need that here. So what you have to then have is begin and somewhere end and then end task. And the stuff between the begin and the end within the task is what the task will do. And it has to follow any input register or output or wired declarations. So it's at the bottom of the task. So what we see here is I wait for a negative edge of the clock. I set up the inputs for the relevant, for the various channels. Then I wait for the next negative edge of the clock. And now we see some new syntax. Uh, this should be familiar. I do if the data output is not equal to the expected data output, begin a line, begin a block of code, end a block of code. And in here, this is a simulation function. It's nothing to do with uh, hardware. Uh, what this will do is it will print something to the output window down here at the bottom. And what this is going to print is this string where percent %d is substituted by the decimal representation of whatever signal I give it, whatever wire or register. So in this case, I'm going to say if the output on the A channel is not equal to what I expected it to be, then I'm going to say the test failed on channel A, and I'm going to print out the input data and the output data. Now it's important you have both pieces of data, of course, because of, if you don't have the input data, you might know what the failing output is, but you don't know how to generate that. Likewise, if you have the input, then you'd have to go and, but without the output, you'd have to go and run that test again in simulation to pick out what the actual output value was. So it's useful to print out all the information. These take standard printf style format strings, which you can look up online. Percent %d is just a decimal number. It's also possible to print things in binary and hexadecimal and uh, with a fixed number of digits and other formats. And if you also look up the documentation for dollar display, you'll find a way to actually distinguish between messages and errors. But in this case, I'm just sticking with plain old dollar display. So this will check the output on the A channel and this will check the output on the B channel. So now we've actually got something that's looking more like a proper test bench and not just debugging because we can drive some inputs and check the outputs. But we need to make use of this. So let's go back here and delete the code that we had. And we'll start trying to use this task. So let's call test channels and then we'll give it some input. So the input goes channel select, channel select, command, command, data, data, expected outputs. So channel select zero, channel one. So channel A will be directed to the first buffer underneath, so channel B will also be directed to the second buffer, so they're currently gonna be independent. The command, well, let's give channel A the command push, and let's give channel B no command, then let's do some data. data. So again, I'm gonna do dead beef, because it's very easy to identify and see what's going wrong with things. And then for the other channel, I'm going to do dead beef, but with a, well, let's do a variation. Perhaps I could do um, uh, I could do dead code for the other one, for example, because uh, it's not supposed to do anything. Or I could do something like uh, a pattern. You know, if I did 0, 2, 1, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2. Uh, that's a nice identifiable pattern that if it's broken, then we know something went wrong. Uh, but again, it should be no command, so it shouldn't interfere in any way. Uh, and then I can do the expected output. So this is where I should calculate what the output should be. Well, there are multiple ways I could do this. For the moment, I'm going to work, try and work it out ahead of time. But really what we'd ideally do is use a function to actually work out uh, what the output should be. But in this case, I'm just going to hard code it to start with. And I know that because this is a push command and no command, the output should be zero. 
Okay, great. So that's done something very simple. Um, let's do another test. Let's say, for example, we wanted to run a pop on the A channel to the first buffer. Now, a pop, the data shouldn't matter, so we'll give this some pattern of values. Uh, for the sake of argument, I'm going to give it 5, 2, 6, 2, 7, 2, 8, 2, and then I'm going to change the 2s to 3s. So this will enable us to distinguish slightly. So you see, these, are in, these aren't necessarily the best possible inputs I could use, but these are at least distinct inputs. So this pattern is definitely a different number to that pattern uh, at every digit, uh, in hex at least. It won't detect every possible error. And then I want to see what my output is. So I'm expecting the output of a pop to be the same as what I pushed. And because this is black box, I can't look inside. So I've got to do one command followed by another to find out what the result was, because this is a stack. Uh, for the calculator test bench, maybe you need to, maybe you don't. So now I've got two tests in here, and I know what the expected output should be. So I should be able to run this test bench now. So I'm going to go to my project tab, right click, compile, compile selected, wait for it to tell me it was successful, simulate, start simulation, no optimization, and select the thing I want to simulate. Go into the wave, let's select the signals that we're interested in, add to wave selected signals, expand this so we can view it, and now Let's just run the simulation to its end. Okay, so if we expand this up, we can see that when we ran our simulation, we got a message. And that message was, uh, sorry, ignore the fact that I double clicked on it. That message said, test failed on channel A for the inputs zero, two, number, and output. So our output was zero when we expected it to be a value. Okay, so what happened? Let's go to the full view. We can see here we drove our first command and then we drove our second command on two clock cycles later. Okay, so we waited a bit. We did one clock cycle wait and this is presumably where we logged our output. Now, we don't have a timestamp for this. In your test bench example, it shows you how to put a timestamp on this so you can know exactly where in simulation it went wrong. I've chosen not to do that here, uh, and I'm not going to bother to include it now. So then we waited another time step and another one, and we finally got some kind of value out over here. So for some reason, it's waited one, two, three clock cycles from getting the input to actually produce our output. This seems like it might be an error initially, but on closer inspection of the code, uh, what you'd see is that the dual buffer section introduces a delay between the inner buffer and the output. So it actually creates a one clock cycle delay from the input to the dual buffer to passing that input to the underlying buffer and then similarly coming back out again the output from the underlying buffer is delayed by one clock cycle. So here the error appears to be in the test bench at least for this moment. So I'm not going to bother to end the simulation what I can do is I can go straight into my test bench and I can restart the simulation from here and we see we get all optimizations are turned off this is fine and by the way this wouldn't work if you had optimization switched on this, this would go wrong at this point but because we've got optimization switched off this is going to work so instead of waiting just one clock cycle i can wait two or three clock cycles i'm going to try waiting three clock cycles if I go over to the project tab, which is kind of hiding here, you can use these little arrows to move around if you need to. I can do compile, compile selected, tells me it's successfully compiled. Go back to the waveform. If I now click restart simulation, it will load that new, newly compiled file. 
If you don't click restart simulation, it will simulate the old version of the file. So please, please, please remember to click restart whenever you recompile or just end the simulation and start it again. So if we now do our simulation again, we see that we still get the message test failed on the channel with something and zero output. So we look back here and we say, okay, we went one, two, three. The output was here on the third clock cycle. How odd. So why shouldn't that work? Well, what you may or may not be aware of is that there are actually within a single time step or a single moment, there are deltas and these deltas are what's really happening. Uh, so I don't know whether that's going to show me the deltas or not. Expand all. There we go. So now if I zoom out, we see that there's the full time and it's highlighted in blue. And if I zoom into this, there are deltas occurring inside this step. So this is where the clock went to the negative edge on this exact moment here. And this point is when the simulation evaluated the delta for the output changing. So we tested the input at this moment, but the, sorry, we tested the output at this moment, but the actual output didn't change in simulation until here. And this is actually accurate to real hardware to some extent um, because of races. So what we have to do is somehow delay our check so that we're checking when this delta has occurred and when the, when the output has actually been updated for this clock cycle. So if we go back into our test bench, we can see we've got at neg edge clock and we know how to do a simulation tick delay. If we want to delay by one nanosecond or one simulation tick, we just put hash one and then a semicolon and that will delay the code by one tick. So now I can recompile, compile selected, back into my waveform, click restart. I'm going to turn off the expanded time and I'm going to run the simulation. Okay, so I've hit my dollar stop again. I can look in the waveform, go to full view, and we see that that's where we were checking. And this time, if we look, we see test failed on channel A and the output was different from what we expected the input to be by, in this case, three in decimal. <coughs> Actually, no, it's more than three, sorry. It's a lot more than three uh, by, the looks of, by the looks of things. Um, so what might be happening here? Well, if I zoom in, uh, well, I don't need to zoom in. I can look right here. So we've got dead Beth zero and we expected to see dead beef. So what we can see from this is that our value's gone up uh, from dead beef. Uh, it's actually now an incorrect value. And we were, this means there's some kind of data corruption occurring inside of our module. Now I've actually introduced this bug for the purposes of this testing because uh, it was working fine before. So I've actually introduced a bug, but what we can see is that this test is now telling us exactly what bug I've introduced. Um, so I know exactly what input is causing that and what sequence of inputs is causing that. And I could go looking for that bug and fix it, but I'm going to leave it for now. So that gives us a really simple test bench that's trying out some values. Okay. So I've ended the simulation there. And the last thing I want to try, the last two things I want to try and cover are how to use a function to actually generate a value or generate the correct expected output value. And also how to split up your code into multiple files so that you don't have all your tasks sitting in a single file or all your functions in a single file. So let's start by looking at how we could use a function. Um, so let's declare a function and what this function is going to do is tell us uh, what the correct output for a channel should be. 
So this will take an input, and that input is probably going to be the command that we need. And we'll also have an input for the data that we're going to input to the design. set this up and we don't need the um, output declaration because the function name itself is actually an output so I'm going to do end function there now this hasn't done anything yet um, what I do need to do is write the code to fill it in and uh, so I'm going to do that now and then we'll come back to this uh, when I filled the function in Okay, so I've now filled in our function with a bit more information. So instead of just doing function and then the name of the function, I've now added uh, some information about the size of this. So on its own, that function would be a single bit return result. Uh, so it would output a single bit value. In this case, I actually wanted to output a multi-bit value. I wanted to output a 32-bit value because word size is currently set to 32. So in a similar way to inputs, outputs, wires, registers, uh, all I do is this function and then the size I want it to be and then the name of the function and the semicolon. My inputs, I've still got the command, but in this case, I've actually renamed this to the previous push data. So I don't want the data that I'm currently uh, putting into the design. What I really want is the previous value um, that was pushed onto the stack. Um, and you can think about how that might be useful. Uh, so then we get the begin and end, just like with task, which says what the function is going to do. And we have case brackets command. The brackets are necessary. And what this will do is it will match um, the value of command against whatever values you put here. Now, in this case, I've actually used the named um, definitions for the values, but I could have done just tick h uh, zero something some code uh, and if you want to put multiple lines of code inside a, a case uh, selection then you do the case colon and begin and end to declare a block of code and then you can put your multiple lines of code uh, in this here so all i've done is use these definitions for the commands and to set the output of a function, you set the name of the function to a value, and you always use this kind of equals. Um, some of you may notice in other Verilog code that there is this kind of assignment. This is called non-blocking assignment. A single equals is blocking assignment. Um, without explaining what those do or why there's a difference, uh, for your code, you just want to use blocking assignment for the test bench. Uh, please don't get yourself into a mess by using both non-blocking and blocking assignment. Uh, you really shouldn't need non-blocking assignment uh, for this verification task. Um, it's needed for more complex code or design code. So what I've done here is I said case command of, and then there's four different commands, and I've set the output of the function to be the value that I'd expect. So for none and push, we expect no output. And for pop and peak, we expect uh, the previous thing that was pushed onto the stack. So now I can call this function. Um, in this case, I'm going to call correct output. Uh, the command is uh, push and the previous data, well, there wasn't any at this point. So we're going to assume that the design reset correctly uh, to zero. And then for the B, this is command none. And we start to see that some of these lines get a bit long. So you can use variables and, and things within your code. Uh, and we'll look at that in a future week in more detail. But for now, we're just going to look at this. So command pop. And now I'm going to give it the previous value that was pushed, which was dead beef. OK. So if I line this up nicely, we see that all of this uh, should just work correctly. <coughs> okay, so there we go. Those are our two tests now. 
And hopefully we've used this function. So if I try to compile this, compile selected, we see the compilation was successful. So now instead of uh, hard coding the correct result, we're actually computing the correct result from the inputs. In the case of this stack, we still have to, I'm still hard coding what the previous thing pushed was. Um, there are other ways around that that we might look at in future weeks. Um, but this is still better. I'm not having to hard code an exact output where I might make a mistake. And if I change these commands, it will change accordingly. Again, I might like to use variable or something in future weeks uh, to make sure that these commands always match. Okay, so we can simulate this as well. Do buffer, click OK. Again, we have to go into waveform and the signals we want. Expand this out and run the simulation to its end. And again, we see the same failure on the test that we expected to see with the same failing value. So something I haven't done here is actually printed out the expected value. That might be useful if I put that in here. I just add another percent %d and then add the expected output. Um, do the same here and so on and so forth. So you could start to expand the amount of information you can get out of your test bench, which would be very useful. So I'm going to end the simulation there. And the last thing we're going to cover is how you can split these out into multiple files. So if we go to our project, we can do uh, add to project new file. And we're going to add a Verilog file. You can use system Verilog if you want to. It's got a slightly steeper learning curve, but there are some useful features in there. Uh, for writing your test benches that you'll want potentially. We'll go through more advanced features of things like system Verilog, uh, variables and, and stuff like that uh, in future weeks. Um, for, the, for now, this is enough to get you set up with a good structure. In future weeks, we'll also look at how you can check stuff in parallel to driving it. At the moment, we're just driving some inputs and then sequentially checking the outputs but that might not actually be so useful uh, always. So we're going to add this to our current folder and we're going to call it, uh, let's just call it tasks.v for now. You'll want to give it a more descriptive name um, in future, but I'm just going to call mine tasks.v. So in this Verilog file, I'm going to include the stuff I want, um, which is going to be from here. So to include the stuff I want, I'm just going to cut from this file, control X, save that, and then go to my task.v and paste it in here. And uh, dedent all of this code slightly to make it look neater. Uh, oops. So Code formatting is important. We will be looking at your code. Uh, we hope that you present it neatly uh, and in a way that we can read. And if you include comments and full documentation, all the better. So we notice that in this task.v file, uh, these signals are not actually directly accessible uh, and that's intentional. So this, this task.v file does not stand on its own. And if we tried to compile it, we'd actually get lots of errors because those signals don't exist, undefined variable, undefined variable, and so on. So you can't compile this separated file on its own. You have to include it somewhere else and you have to include it in order. Uh, so if we included, wherever you include it, it literally takes the contents of the included file and puts it straight in where the include statement is. So I'm gonna include it here. Uh, so we just write include uh, tasks.v. Okay, so compiling task.v on its own doesn't work, but if I compile dual buffer underscore tb.v, we see it works. If I comment out this line of code and try and compile it, compile selected, well, it also says successful, um, but it won't be because test channels doesn't exist in this copy of the code. Um, so if I do simulate, start simulation, 
from here uh, and run this. Then we get an error. And if I scroll up, we see error, unresolved reference to test channels. So although we can compile this file without the include, because the include is commented out, and it will give us a successful compilation, when you try to run the simulation, it will give you this unresolved reference to test channels, because test channels hasn't been included. So we include the file, we compile the selected file, we compile that to the test bench, start simulation, run the dual buffer simulation, and this time it loads successfully because the file has been included at this point in the, in the file. Similarly, I can do other things, so I could end the simulation. Uh, if I move where this is declared in the file, we'll see that we get some problems. So if I include it at the top of the module, and then uh, go into project, compile, compile selected, we get nine errors. And again, we see while parsing file included, blah, 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 undefined variable channel select A. Okay, so the problem here is basically I've included it before these declarations. So the things it's referencing don't exist. And we see here that in Verilog, things have to be declared before they can be used. So you can't declare a function after a task and then use it. You have to declare it beforehand. I can do the same thing for functions if I do add to project, new file, call it functions.v, set it to being a Verilog file, click OK, edit this file, take my function and put it in here. Again, deal with code formatting. Save that and then include it, which is a backtick which is on the top left of your keyboard, just underneath the escape key. You just press it and you'll get a back tick. Uh, no need for shift or anything. And then we do functions.v. Now also remember that Linux is case sensitive, whereas Windows isn't. If you are developing on your own laptop, uh, not remotely, then please make sure your case, uh, the names of files, the cases match. We won't debug your code to fix issues like that. It has to just work. So you do also test on uh, Frosty or on the Linux machines in the university um, to make sure that that works properly. Uh, as I say, we won't spend time debugging your code for you. If we now compile this, it run, it compiles successfully, uh, and we can. If we did the simulation again, it would work just fine. So this is how we can split our code out into multiple files. I've also demonstrated how you can use tasks to drive and check uh, in a sequential fashion and how you can use functions to generate values uh, for you or compute values so you don't have to hard code stuff. Uh, you should also know how to use a loop at this point. So if you wrapped these tests in a loop, you could then iterate through uh, by passing a variable in instead of a hard coded value, for example. Um, and you should also know how to stop and how to display information uh, using dollar display. In future weeks, we'll look at how you can drive and check in parallel. We'll also look at some slightly more advanced features of Verilog and of system Verilog that will make it easier to write your test bench. But I hope this is enough for you to get started for now. See you in the lab on Wednesday uh, or the drop-in session on Thursday.